Welcome to the Shockwave Therapy Podcast. My name is James Woolwich, Osteopath and Clinical Director at the Abbey Pills Clinic in Suffolk. We will be trying to demystify the concept of shockwave treatment whilst bringing together experts in their field to discuss the latest research. If you are deciding on whether to add this modality into your clinic or just improve the way you deliver it, then we hope this is the podcast for you. Welcome to our latest podcast. Today we're going to be getting some insight from a specialist physiotherapist, Chris Myers, on the use of ultrasound and imaging in in treating uh, tendon disorders with shockwave therapy, um, which is an emerging field as the technology becomes um, cheaper and better quality. Um, Those of us as AHPs in this country, physiotherapists, osteopaths and so forth, uh, are likely to be uh, getting into this field um, much more. Chris Myers is is, is a well-known physiotherapist and, and osteopath as well as sonographer for the last 10 years. He runs his own um, teaching group called SMUG, which are an excellent group for doing postgraduate training. He's a visiting lecturer at Canterbury University and UCL, amongst others. Um, There's not much he doesn't know about uh, sonography and indeed ultrasound-guided injections. So it'd be interesting to get his views today um, on his decision-making, for instance, on whether he uses injections or shockwave in certain conditions and, um, and the importance he places upon gaining more information um, basically on tissues uh, using ultrasound. So thanks for coming on the podcast today, Chris. I think that- the- Thanks for having me. Thank you. So I think the, the main thing that I wanna get across today for people listening is, is that ultrasound scanning um, mm-hmm. is definitely on the up and that you run a number of courses and we can, we can put some links to that after this. Right. And I think that people are starting to ask more questions about, well, you know, if we've got ultrasound scans available and, you know, it gives us a better view of that big long tendon, shouldn't we always be doing it for tendons before we shockwave or or whatever else? So before we get into too much of that, can you just give people a summary of where you're at with your career and what what your clients are like in London and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. So I run, I've got two businesses, Complete Physio. We've got six clinics in London, uh, of which we have shockwave in three. Uh, one focused machine, the Piazza Wave, and we have two uh, radial uh, machines. Um, my other business is Smug, so the Sports Medicine Ultrasound Group, and we're, we're doing lots and lots and more and more diagnostic ultrasound teaching. Mm. Um, we run lots of different courses, and I suppose I'm quite, I'm very passionate about clinicians, osteopaths, physios, sports doctors, learning diagnostic ultrasound. It's an incredible tool to have uh, with you in clinic. It brings imaging straight away into that clinical context. And I'm very passionate that clinicians should be using diagnostic ultrasound. Now, when you've come from diagnostic ultrasound first, shockwave second, mm. for me and in my practice, nobody will get shockwave unless they've had a diagnostic ultrasound scan. And that's how I want to work. I'm not saying everybody needs to, and there's arguments both sides, yeah. but for certain conditions, I think that they should. But when you are giving a very specific diagnosis, I believe you can then give a more specific treatment. Now, I'm not saying there's evidence to support this, but this is how I want to work. Mm. Um, and so for me, the problem I have with shockwave is the lack of diagnosis in the first place. And so there's lots of people buying shockwave machines, just like there's lots of people buying diagnostic ultrasound machines. Yeah. Um, so don't get me wrong, there's definitely parallels there, but for me, shockwave is being overused the evidence is okay it is not great okay it is not great i've looked at all them there's very little evidence out there of good quality and there's a lot of blanket terms about shockwave is great for that shockwave is great for that shockwave makes money in clinics that's partly why it's got popular and for me it's great that shockwave is there all shockwave is in most cases and uh, conditions is an adjunct to your rehab, it's an adjunct treatment. It should never be used in most cases as standalone treatment. So I'm really, I think it's really great that people are implementing Shockwave into it. I have nothing against Shockwave and I use it and I use it a reasonable amount. But let's go back to the beginning, which is to get the right diagnosis. A clinical assessment, although it is essential and brilliant, it is very limited in giving you a specific clinical structural diagnosis and ultrasound allows you to do that and we have to be aware of the limitations of what clinical assessment can give us Mm. and what it can't give us 
And therefore, for me, it's about doing an ultrasound scan first and then thinking about whether shockwave is appropriate or not. Now, there's not enough evidence to say that that is the way you should do it, mm. but it's the way I believe that it should be done. And what, what do you say? Because rather like, you know, we're all guilty of this, but physios, osteopaths, and anything in musculoskeletal, there tends to be trends that get adopted yeah. and then last about 10 years, you know, sort of core stability is going to be yeah, yeah. that and the other. And then, and then there was a bit of noise that came out that all, all tendon, tendinopathies last in more than three months and no longer inflamed. And now we're back full circle again. Well, they aren't a bit inflamed. They're just a different inflammation and so forth. So we, it, yeah, and, yeah. and definitely the noise that you hear a lot of is this rising sense of ultrasound is, is now more affordable and better quality. But yeah. you've also got this other big noise that people make over here that say that there's not a great deal of evidence at all to correlate the findings of ultrasound in tendinopathies and pathology of tendinopathies, let alone yeah. symptoms that patients feel. So yeah. what, where do you yeah. stand on all of that? Because you, you, you just... Yeah, no, it, it's... I, quite, I, I, I quite, agree, I quite yeah. agree with it being adjunctive and shockwave not being the yeah. absolutely amazing thing that people talk about. And I'm very clear with that when I teach. It's, it's a brilliant adjunct for recalcitrant tendinopathies because the choices yeah. are so minimal. But equally, there are a lot you of... You don't know what it does, really. Well, there is, there is some biological plausibility going on with it. Yeah. Um, but you could point the finger at injections as well. There's a lot of lot of what we don't know about steroid. We go, that shouldn't work, but it, it has. And yeah, equally, yeah. I thought that was going to work, and bloody yeah, yeah. it didn't. So yeah, yeah. I think there's all of that stuff Is there inflammation? There. Is there not? Should yeah. we do anti-inflammatory? Yeah, or should exactly. we do pro-inflammatory? Like, That's absolutely right. And we I think are stuck long, in a... We don't know as, if the answer. We that, don't that, know. And that, I think, is a responsible clinical summary is being brave enough to go, we don't quite know. So no, don't. You know, I'm like that with Shockwave, but I think the nice thing about Shockwave is that it's not invasive. It's not going to cause you any issues. Yeah. Why wouldn't you try it for something that's yeah. not getting better with normal means? That's all I say yeah. about it. Nothing more magnificent. Yeah. So we're on the same page with that. It's so totally. let's, let's go back to this sort of concept of... So, so let's, yeah, being, I totally not, agree. Not being correlated with it. Where do you sit with that aspect? Yeah. Because if you find false positives and false negatives everywhere and that noise is being made... Every, every day in clinic, I find pathology that is irrelevant. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And we know that as we get older, there's lots of asymptomatic pathology. Now, it doesn't mean that that pathology isn't impacting the chain elsewhere or another structure that then does become painful. Mm. But the key thing for me is exactly what you said, is this imaging has to be put into a clinical context. Mm. Uh, it's quite dangerous, actually, otherwise. So in London, there'll be lots of people that pretty much self-refer and go and get an MRI and walk back and say, I've got a full thickness tear in my supraspinatus. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you're 65. What do you expect? Scan the other side. It would probably be the same. So, but who is my, 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 my thing for that is what you've said there proves to me that if you're going to do imaging, mm -hmm. it needs to be in the hands of the clinician. Yeah. Yeah. That's the key thing. So Diagnostic ultrasound for me as a physio, as an osteo, is just an extension of my clinical assessment. So quite different to, say, a radiologist. And the further that imaging has taken place from the clinical context, so the clinical assessment, I'd, su I'd suggest that more chance there is of the meaning of that imaging being um, falsely interpreted. And, and just as important, if not more important, falsely interpreted in terms of the communication to the patient. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, the communication of the imaging is more important than the imaging itself. Mm. But for me, that doesn't, in no way does it make me think I shouldn't scan and gain that information. Yeah, it's just more information, but it's not everything that that's, you pin it. It's not the whole thing that you, you pin everything it. on, right? Yeah. I think that's so where, this, where, is, where is the on, noise is made yeah. and people have pinned everything yeah. on correlations yeah. poor so what's the point of doing yeah. it Whereas who would you saying, rather go and see yeah exactly who would you rather go and see if you had an achilles problem somebody that's going to get some information or somebody that's going to get more information <laughs> yeah, you could just stop there couldn't you because that's just well, you can't argue that, point. that yeah you can't uh, argue exactly that that's it for me i'm very i'm very black and white i don't i struggle to see the other side yeah other yeah. than as the, the problem is if you don't scan and this is going to sound patronizing to people that scan but oh well if you don't scan you don't get it you don't get you don't know what you don't know no true yeah um, and that's where we have to be aware of the limitations so i can put forward a very strong opinion 
about diagnostic ultrasound. At the same time, do I think that every physio and osteopath should do diagnostic ultrasound? Absolutely not. Some of the best physios I've got are, are the rehab physios, but my clinic is set up that I might do a scan at the beginning and then I send them off for the rehab with the person that is great at rehab. Yeah, yeah. As somebody that does diagnostic ultrasound, I've committed 13, 14 years. I hate to think how many days watching YouTube, how many days scanning myself, how, you know, and as a result of that, and this is really important for clinicians thinking about ultrasound, you've got to let something else go. Mm. You can't be a specialist in everything. And I struggled with that. Mm. But as I've got older and I've seen what my role is, I'm not great at doing, getting in the gym and, you know, when was the last time I saw a fresh ACL? I can't remember. Mm. I'm attracting the patients that have had three opinions, two opinions that have had surgery. And that's the group I enjoy working with. But I'm not great at ACL rehab anymore. Ten years ago, I used to be brilliant. Mm. So if you're thinking about diagnose, diagnostic ultrasound, you've got to be at the stage of your career where you're happy to commit this massive amount to ultrasound and give other things up. Otherwise, don't bother leave it to other people and concentrate on what you want to concentrate on. Sage advice. So going back to your decision, I know that you have your disposal injection therapies as well. Yeah. So it's interesting, I think, for people that use various different modalities. If you've got all of the modalities at your fingertips, can you give us some idea as to what, how you use ultrasound or yeah. your, your, the context of what your assessment is, is to, to decide what intervention you're going to use where yeah. you use focus and radial yeah, yeah. yeah and you inject it i think you do, you do prp as well uh, yeah yeah we do prp yeah. as well so yeah yeah just give us a little thought process about yeah, yeah. what your decision making is and where you go with those things that, that's a really good question and over the years you know when you get lots of information and over the years it starts to go into compartments and probably simplifies it so i think about whether a condition as we've already talked about and we don't know the answer but we sort of do is whether something is inflammatory or something is degenerative non-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. If something's inflammatory, I'd like to go with an anti-inflammatory approach. Okay, this is very simple, but yeah, this, yeah. You, it comes into what I'm about to, to say with from your question. If something is not inflamed, then I'm gonna go for obviously an, a, a pro-inflammatory approach, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think, and this comes back to tissue diagnosis, what gets inflamed in the body that we know gets inflamed? Anything with itis. So one of the biggest causes of pain in any joint is not the joint surfaces. It might be the subchondral bone, but there's definitely sign of itis. Mm -hmm. So that's an itis. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to shockwave an itis. I might think about an injection or offloading or whatever. The paratenon of the Achilles, you have a big paratenon around the Achilles, particularly when it's swollen. If that is a paratendonitis, I'm not gonna do shockwave on it, okay? And you don't know that from your clinical assessment necessarily. So in theory, there's people shockwaving inflamed tissue, which for me doesn't make too much sense. Mm -hmm. The next itis is bursitis. So shoulders, um, elbow joints, uh, retrocalcaneal bursas, pre-Achilles bursas, so the superficial of the kids, that is an inflammatory problem I may consider, not as a first line of defense, but I may consider at some point an injection. So I'm looking for a synovitis, a bursitis, a tenosynovitis. Um, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah, now, if enough. I go to a bog, if it, I go to With a or without the presence of an underlying tendinopathy, basically. So they could have that exactly. as well, but if so they've I'll got that, this, you I'll, then... Yeah. I'll come on to a few examples. And, and, and the, the second thing is, if it's not inflamed, then, a, you know, like a patella tendinopathy, let's assume it's not all inflammation, which it probably isn't. Uh, mid Achilles portion tendon, any sort of tendinopathy, mm. a chronic condition like that, and, and then potentially an enthesopathy as well, which I think is where shockwave does do quite well, which is interesting because that maybe is where there's more inflammation. But anyway, um, so, so then I would go for a pro-inflammatory, like try and kickstart that healing process, which is a lovely phrase that we all uh, like, to, like to use. So that's how, that's how I work. So let's go to a few examples. Insertional Achilles walks in. And again, depending on your anatomical knowledge, if you look at the insertion, the first layer is the skin. 
Then in the next layer, you have your pre-Achilles bursa, which is just a potential space between the skin and the Achilles. Then you have your insertion of your Achilles. Then under that, just a bit further up, you have your retrocalcaneal bursa, and then you have your calcaneum. Now, if I put shockwave through that, I'm shockwaving the bursa, which is shockwaving the Achilles, depending on obviously whether it's focused or radial, but let's appreciate there's going to be shockwave going through yeah, all the yeah. tissues at some point. And then underneath, you've got that bursa. So as I've said, I don't want to shockwave a stress fracture of the calcaneum. There, that happens. Um, I don't want to shockwave a bursa because I think that's more pro-inflammatory. So if it's an insertion or Achilles, I want to know if there is a bursitis. Otherwise, all you're doing is shockwaving a bursa, which just the thought of it sounds horrible. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, the, and you might still desensitize. Yeah, they might feel a bit better, but are you getting that carryover? Are they gets better? Now, obviously, most of the time, these can occur more than one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. But from the ultrasound, particularly with the power Doppler mode, you can see if there is that active inflammation, for want of a better term, all you're seeing is a bit of extra blood flow, which we're assuming is either a healing process or is inflammation. Because right. actually, if it's healing, yeah. You, you know, it could just be that it's normal healing if it's within those normal healing times. Yeah. Um, and often they occur together, but you generally get an impression. And if there's lots going on, well, you're probably going to not do the steroid injection to start with, and you're going to go for more of a non-invasive loading issue. I also want to check that there's no tear yeah. as well. And I do have an issue with That's the lack fear. of ultrasound or the lack of imaging going on before shockwave. It is becoming, and I'm quite happy to say it because it's true, it's becoming a blanket. Oh, we could yeah. shockwave that. Oh, yeah. we could shockwave that. Well, shockwave what? You don't even know what you're shockwaving. Yeah. That, and that is what I say. I say, what are you shockwaving? Well, the Achilles. Well, what about it? You know. And that's where I, I would hate to do my job if I'm involved in the diagnosis of a condition without ultrasound. And yes, you can argue it the other way, but that's just how I want to work. And if you don't want to work like that, no problem. But just think twice about uh, popping the shockwave on before you know all the information yeah. or work closely with somebody that can yeah. get you in. And, and we, we do that. And actually, as you know, I'm going to actually do my ultrasound course this year. Yeah, that's my biggest without you put, I mean, it's really nicely that you put about the, the itises and making sure that you haven't got one of those as well as or independent of mm. that wouldn't have been my main thought process six months ago when I thought I'd actually do some ultrasound scan mm. courses and my, my and if fear you don't, is my if fear you don't is the inject, rush yeah my fear if you is don't inject, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not going to inject, inject but I want to know that that Achilles has not got a massive tear yeah, yeah. through it and it yeah. might be something they've had for six months and we always use this sort of rather artificial idea with tendinopathies that if they've had it six months it's probably stable it hasn't got a tear it's probably healed but there's no reason why they can't have an acute flare-up with a tear in amongst a tendinopathy exactly. and, and then, i'm not saying yeah exactly that and i'm not saying at any point i won't shockwave a tear because it's i don't believe it's a contraindication there's some caveats to that yeah. if it's an acute if somebody has been running across the road and they go ow and you think there may be a partial tear of something or whatever, then I wouldn't shockwave that within the normal healing times of that tissue. I might after three months. The, the issue we have, and this brings up another uh, issue we have when we just don't know, we don't even know, and people may say that's not true, but you just have to believe that I teach radiologists, I teach, we don't know whether a tear within a degenerative tendon is a tear, as we think about it, or whether it is just focal degeneration. So on an ultrasound, you'll see a dark patch. Yeah. We don't know whether to call. So if you go and see a radiologist, they'll probably call that a tear. So right. you've gone to see a radiologist and they say, or if you do an MRI, often MRI just sees a slip of fluid in the tendon. Mm -hmm. I'd call it a bit of tendinopathy. They call it a tear because there's fluid there. It's a longitudinal split. How interesting. Now, as the patient, this is just terminology. Yeah. And it always makes me think words matter, words matter. Mm. If, you get, if you get told you've got a tear in your Achilles, you are going to do nothing. Mm. The next day you come and see me and you go, yeah, you've got a focal line, but I wouldn't call it a tear, but some people would. There's no right or wrong. And I say, this is a de degeneration. You need to load it. Yeah. You know, it, it's, mm. it's literally black and white, the information you're being given. Yeah. And, and it's a big problem. It's a big problem. It is. And I, and I think that and going back to what you said about the fact that shockwaves become this new sort of found panacea for everything to do with tendons, a bit like ultrasound 
uh, treatment was 15, 20 years ago. You just, if in doubt, you just whack yeah, yeah. on it. And something um, else will come along. Yeah, for sure, they will. The um, super duper focused shockwave machine will come along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, but yeah, that, that the problem is if you couch it in amongst, as we should couch it in amongst management and so on and so forth, surely having more, more information about the tendon is only going to be a good thing because you're yeah. right. You need to have some sort of ability to understand at the very least, even if it's an introduction course, which I'm, I'm doing soon, yeah. that the terminology you get to hear off radiologists say, oh, that might not be quite what they mean. And, you know, it might mean this, it might mean that, but actually I can still load the tendon and give confidence to the patient. And often, mm. as we know, when we've been around long enough, it, it is often the words that matter more than the actual magic yeah, machine that you is. put on it. Although yeah. I'm obviously an advocate of shockwave, but yeah, yeah. but there, there are specific and, and so am I. I'm, a, I'm an advocate of shockwave, yeah, yeah. but it's it's got to be put within the overall um, clinical picture, uh, and and it's it is it's it's useful. It's a useful tool, and we've got as I say, we've got three of them, and we've got the focus one now because we're looking a bit more towards bony pathology and yeah, yeah. somebody that sees lots of calcification on ultrasound, which I can assure you most of the time does not need to go or get better for the pain to, to resolve yeah. I, I can i can categorically tell you that radial shockwave is it just didn't change the calcification to the extent that i thought it would yeah. so now i've got a focus shockwave i'm hoping yeah, yeah. that three four five months down the line that supersplated calcification that i tried to file the charge and couldn't get it all out now yeah. completely goes yeah i'm I mean, not I, I, sure it will happen but i i'm looking forward to finding out because we only got it about six months ago yeah I mean, we don't we don't see a lot of them in our clinic because I think they tend to go off because, the, the, you know, the selling feature of Shockwave to me is it's not invasive. Why wouldn't you try it before you? Sorry, what don't invasive? you see a lot of? What don't you see uh, a lot of? A, a, um, calcific tendonitis of the shoulder. But it's because you don't scan. Well, part, they're there. Part, they're because, walking to your clinic, but you just don't know it. I promise you. I think partly because of that, I agree. But also the other thing is that, that compared to barbitage, which is which is very effective. Shockwave doesn't offer a unique solution because there's already a good solution. The thing about shockwaves, you know, which I like, is that when you've run out of options, which is very quick actually with tendinopathy, they've done all the loading, yeah. or you've got someone that's not really up for doing it. Yeah, what, else are you gonna, what else are you going to do before you yeah, inject? Yeah. I go, well, well, shockwave, why wouldn't you do that? You know, it's always yeah. a, a no brainer for me. But with barbitage, yeah. it's so excellent when you've really identified yeah, it. Yeah, when it, yeah. But I've yeah. had two, and these, this is useful for you to know because we've got similar machines, different makers, or whatever else. But I used to use radial, and as my physio for, for, since 2013, I used to think we were getting somewhere, but we didn't. And actually, I had these two cases come along. I had a focus device. I thought, right, I'm going to send them off. I, go, I need a guy, the radiologist, get them x-rayed and ultrasound scan, da, 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 everything else. So I had the x-ray, I had the images, and then I booked them in for the barbitage. I said, right, in that space of time, four or five weeks, we're going to do three sessions of focus shockwave on it. And one of them, funnily enough, was a radiologist as a patient. But she, she was completely cynical. So it was an opposite of placebo, mm -hmm. nocebo involved. And the other yeah. person was just desperately in agony. And both of those went off to um, barbitage, although they were absolutely symptom-free. They still kept their appointment because I said, he'll still scan you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely gone in three weeks yeah. of treatments. So, yeah. yeah, you could argue it might have spontaneously resolved. But one of those cases was actually a shoulder problem that he had over six months. The other one was a fast, fast-moving one that went from nothing to awful in about three or four weeks. Yeah, so it's different which is quite that. common with cas the, cas yeah. the classic calcification is like, Saturday night, it just comes on. Yeah. And so I, no, I hope it works. I totally yeah. hope it works. And, and I'm in a position to know if it works yes. because I can pre scan, post scan. Yeah. Bearing in mind, I would allow six months for that change though. Yeah. Even after. Yeah. But they will take, I'll get them back probably just for free just to, yeah. just to know. Yeah. Um, but what is important, two things just on calcification. One is uh, ultrasound is gold standard. So your x rays won't pick up a lot of calcifications. That's really right. important to know. That's good. I didn't MRI know yeah. will miss calcifications. MRI will miss calcifications. Okay. Ultrasound is by far the, the clearest because you see the, the the bones so clearly. Okay. Um, and as so, yeah, so 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 that's something worth thinking about. And also the um, the my experience on the shock waves so far of the calcifications of the focus. I've done a few like you have that it. I can't, I don't know if I'm convincing myself, but even if it's not gone, it seems to have changed shape, but mm. I don't know. The I important see. thing is the patient's pain goes. That's There's, right. You know, That's exactly yeah. all I say to patients as well. When they've got lumpy heels and, you know, yeah. Hagland deformity, yeah, yeah. I say, we're not going to focus on the lump size of that at all. But if you get no, exactly. pain, then that's great. 
Yeah. Some of them, I, I think I've convinced myself they've reduced in size a little bit. But we do yeah. know that Shockwave is not an ablative treatment like we thought it was. It doesn't just go buff and break things up. Yeah, yeah. It no, creates it's a nice not. little immune response, which then hopefully yeah. starts to eat away at it. But, you know, yeah. any N equals two on the basis of my trial day. Yeah, exactly. And I, mine won't be much, much bigger either. So, yeah, so um, but the other thing is, um, if you go back to the research on low back and MRI, and we know that it's, mm. you know, it's, it probably doesn't help prognosis and that sort of thing. Yeah. And there is a risk. There's two things that worry me at the moment. One is I do loads of ultrasound teaching, which is not doesn't worry me. It's great. But mm. it does mean we're encouraging a lot of rubbish ultrasonographers. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of those people are not seeing it through. So if anybody is listening, if you're going to start ultrasound, dare you, thousands. You've you've got to get good at it, and you've got to see yeah, it yeah. through, and you've got to commit the money, the time, the effort yeah, to get yeah, good at it. Yeah. I have massive concerns about the number of osteopaths, particularly, but also physios that yeah. are currently buying handheld ultrasound machines yeah. and not going through the structured learning. It's fine to buy them, yeah, yeah, but yeah. be aware of your limitations, the limitations of your machine and get yourself on some sort of training and a two day yeah. course. We get an email every week going, if I do a two day course, am I competent? Am I insured? And I'm like, okay, just come on the course and we'll, cause you very quickly realize you don't yeah. know what you're doing. Yeah. No, I'm, and we've I'm, all been through that so but it is it takes years it takes a very long time just like it does to become a competent practitioner hmm. and most practitioners are always learning and cpd and that sort of thing and it's the same for ultrasound but it for me it feels like it it, it takes even more because yeah. there's so much to know so much to know yeah okay well i'm starting that journey so. I, I was just saying one other thing as well the with the calcification is Sometimes, and this is where the MRI of the back and that, you can see how it's bad information that's not useful. Mm. Sometimes they don't want to know they've got that calcification. No. Because in their head, they're like, well, that's got to go for yeah, my yeah, pain yeah. to go. Yeah. And they're probably closer to surgery. So you've got to be very yeah. careful. And my big thing is always scan the other side. If yeah. I can find one in there, probably 20 or 30% have calcification on the other side, which is absolutely irrelevant because they're pain free. Mm. Then that helps to. It's like if you get a rotator cuff tear, it helps to say actually you've got it there. So that isn't relevant. Yeah. Obviously, if they don't have it on the side, they they often can focus, and I'm sure those people with the right communication are closer to having surgery. Yeah. Or, or closer to not persevering with their exercises. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely right. So, well, they're, they're, that's the consider. clinical nuance of communication, right? That's just difficult. Yeah, which is than we which is up. way more important than whether you scan or whether you shockwave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's for another podcast. Um, right, yeah. I, I think that's been Scott. Cool. Covered that I thought I think it's been excellent. So, thank you for your very straightforward speaking. And thanks uh, for having me. And I, I will put on links afterwards for the courses that you run. Yeah, and if um, people have got any I, questions, yeah, let I just, mean, I, I say, you know, as, as, a, as a quick, you know, about you, I mean, I've chosen to go on your courses because actually I did a lot of digging around and asking around. Your reputation is excellent. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for coming along today, and I, I will see you soon looking at a cloudy screen, not knowing what on earth. I'm yeah, and I think because I'm an osteopath as well as a physio, most yeah. of the other courses are, are not oste osteopaths, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I get it from that point of view as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, okay. hopefully you enjoy the course. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for us. Soon. Cheers, Chris. Thanks, Jay. Bye bye.
Thanks very much for joining us. It's been really interesting. Cheers, Chris. I'll speak to you soon. Nice to chat. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.